Greetings and welcome back to room 303 of the Harvard Classic Lectures. We are now in lecture number 78, volume number 17. It's called Folklore and Fable. Uh, here, following in lecture six, or, or, uh, in volume 16, we messed around with the Thousand and One Nights. We now come to the stories, fables of Aesop, Grimm, the Grimm brothers, and Hans Christian Andersen. Think about this one. Um, we began so much of what we said together by suggesting that we are the stories that we tell, retell, the stories we accept, the stories that we reject. Think about this. Both the shields that we talked about in our study of the uh, Iliad as well as the Aeneid, both the shields of Achilles and Aeneas remind us that any armor that does not tell a story is no armor. Which is an interesting question. What are the stories on your shield? I mean, think about that as a, as a working metaphor, we might say. Now, if you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, I recommend that you get there, see our previous lectures, 1 through 77. In some ways, I'm going to build each of our lectures building on the next one, since our learning theory is that connecting of new to old. We were just with the Thousand and One Nights in our, in our last lecture, and you'll, uh, if, you've, if you picked up this volume, there's this great, great line that I love, by Allah, O oh my sister, relate to us a story to beguile the waking hour of our night, end quote. I, I love that line because, of course, it sets up so much of the great storytelling of the uh, world's great literary traditions, and we're going to obviously invest some time here. Just to remind again, our learning theory is always trying to connect new to old, and our three levels of reading annotatively is the way we do that. Level one, of course, we're always working to summarize the text. Level 2A, possible themes, messages. At level 2B, we're going to spend some time in all of the lectures that will deal with Aesop's Grimm as well as, as, well as uh, the Anderson stories, looking specifically at issues of symbolism and archetype, as well as uh, then at level 3, how can I relate to this information at 3A? Um, uh, other texts that I'm familiar with, so many childhood stories that we'll point out that you've, uh, many of these, some of you will go, oh, that's where that saying comes from, or that's where that idea comes from. These are very, very old stories. They're, very, they're much older in many ways than the ones who wrote them down, let's just say it that way. And of course, they are the stories of our lives, not just personal, but as well, our cultural lives, the, 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 the culture that we've been uh, raised in, as well as the, the culture that are world cultures. Finally, at 3B, we'll ask maybe some personal relationship questions about, about uh, these texts. Now, let's just overview the volume really quickly, because the next, uh, uh, this, this lecture and the two to follow, will treat specifically these three different uh, great collections of stories. Um, we have 143 separate stories within this volume. 82 of them come from Aesop's Fables. 41 from the Brothers Grimm, and then finally uh, Hans Christian Andersen, 20 stories. Um, without question, this of the Harvard Classics volumes, this was probably the most read by children. But I'm going to argue that we're going to see these stories as remarkably sophisticated. I mean, you guys are going to look at these stories and go, whoa, 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 there's some sometimes very controversial ideas that are being presented here. We're going to say some things about the danger of maybe some of these stories. Um, and sharing these with young children. Um, some of you will say, oh, I heard that story when I was a child, but they didn't give me the full story. That is right, that is right. We said that, of course, of the Thousand and One Nights, the Arabian Nights as well in our previous lecture. We're going to see them, uh, these as stories that tell us tremendous amounts about the Western literary tradition. And we'll separate our lectures up again into these, uh, into these three areas. Now, we're, we're um, specifically treating Aesop here, so let's talk about it for a few moments. A little bit of background inform information. The Aesopica is uh, the collection of stories attributed to Aesop. A lot, a, a, a lot is speculated about whoever this was, if in fact this was a single individual, maybe a slave, certainly a storyteller. Ancient Greece is where we are between roughly 620 and 564 BCE. Think of that. Socrates will die in 399 BC, so that kind of gives you a place to place Aesop. Lots and lots of stories um, are attributed to Aesop. And in many ways, like Homer, they all started out in the oral tradition. After the printing press in Europe, especially Caxon, some of the very first printed stories were in fact Aesop's tales, these fables. 
Um, they are, now let's get this in our notes because this is hypercritical. These are not just stories to entertain. Entertain they will, sometimes make us laugh or whatever, but they are stories that we will call didactic. They are propedeutic. In other words, they're inclining to teach something, right? The, if you will, moral of the story as it sometimes is referred to they saw. As we said, the very first English printed version by William Caxton happens the 26th of March, 1484. And by 1693, John Locke was saying in his Some Thoughts Concerning Children, and a famous essay of his, that these were stories that children needed to hear. Apparently, pre-Locke in this time, these stories were, for the most part, adult stories, which maybe were distilled down to children in some way, as instructional, as we will see. Now, there's about 725 total fables attributed to Aesop, only 82 here in the Harvard Classics. And unfortunately, I don't get to share all of them with you. I wish I could, but I just don't have the time. We're going to look at a few of these. And again, we're going to take a look at level 2B. The power of the symbolism, the instructional model at 2A. Clearly, there's a message that's to be identified with each one of these. I'm going to turn now to just a few of these. And as I said, I wish I could read all of these to you. But let's just read a few of these. The famous town mouse, country mouse. You maybe have heard this one. Now you must know that a town mouse once, upon a time, went on a visit to his cousin in the country. He was rough and ready, this cousin, but he loved his town friend and made him heartily welcome. Beans and bacon, cheese and bread were all he had to offer, but he offered them freely. The town mouse rather turned up his long nose at this country fair and said, I cannot understand, cousin, how you can put up with such poor food as this, but of course, if you cannot expect anything better in the country, Come you with me, and I will show you how to live. When you have been in town a week, you will wonder how you could ever have stood a country life. No sooner said than done, the two mice set off for the town and arrived at the town mouse's residence late at night. You will want some refreshment after our long journey, said the polite town mouse, and took his friend into the grand dining room. There, they found the remains of a fine feast, and soon the two mice were eating up jellies and cakes and all that was nice. Suddenly, they heard growling and barking. What is that? said the country mouse. It's only the dogs of the house, answered the other. Only? said the country mouse. I do not like that music at my dinner. Just at that moment, the door flew open and came two huge mastiffs, and the two mice had to scamper down and run off. Goodbye, cousin, said the country mouse. What? Going so soon, said the other. Yes, he replied. And now the moral? Better beans and bacon in peace than cakes and ale in fear. Now, obviously, the symbolism, and we won't do this for each of these because in many ways it's so self-evident, but notice that the symbolism here is the two mice represent two views, don't they? And, of course, there's always been tension, as we speak of often in 303. There's always been tension between those of us who live in the country versus those of us who live in the city and the different understandings of the cultured versus the uncultured. Uh, the next one that I, that I like to share with you is the swallow and the other birds. It happened, another story, it happened that a countryman was sowing some hemp seeds in a field where a swallow and some other birds were hopping about picking up their food. Beware of that man, quote the swallow. Why? What is he doing? said the others. That is hemp seed he's sowing. Be careful to pick up every one of the seeds or else you will repent. The birds paid no heed to the swallow's words, and by and by the hemp grew up and was made into cord, and of the cord's nets were made, and many a bird that had despised the swallow's advice was caught in nets made out of the very hemp. What did I tell you, said the swallow, and out of the moral, destroy the seed of evil, or it will grow up to your ruin. Now, obviously, the, the, the message here is self-evident, right? That notion of moral uh, intentionality, making sure that we plan accordingly. We're going to see this again and again in a number of these stories. The next one I'll share with you is the woodman and the serpent. This is a fascinating one. Listen to this one. One wintry day, a woodman was tramping home from his work when he saw something black lying on the snow. When he came closer, he saw it was a serpent, to all appearance dead. But he took it up put it in his bosom to warm while he hurried home. As soon as he got indoors, he put the serpent down on the hearth before the fire. The children watched it and slowly saw it come to life again. Then one of them stooped down to stroke it, but the serpent raised its head, put out its fangs, and was about to sting the child to death. So the woodman seized his axe, and with one stroke, cut the serpent in two, and said, No gratitude. 
from the wicked. An interesting story about, of course, this notion of being grateful and gratitude. It's possible uh, that one of the most famous stories of uh, Aesop's is the story of Androcles. So let's go ahead and enjoy this story. A slave named Androcles once escaped from his master and fled to the forest. As he was wandering about there, he came upon a lion lying down, moaning and groaning. At first, he turned to flee, but finding that the lion did not pursue him, he turned back and went up to him. As he came near, the lion put out his paw, which was all swollen and bleeding, and Androcles found that a huge thorn had got into it and was causing all the pain. He pulled out the thorn and bound up the paw of the lion, who was soon able to rise and lick the hand of Androcles like a dog. Then the lion took Androcles to his cave and every day used to bring him meat from which to live. But shortly thereafter, both Androcles and the lion were captured, and the slave was sentenced to be thrown to the lion after the latter had been kept without food for several days. The emperor and all his court came to see the spectacle, and Androcles was led into the middle of the arena. Soon the lion was let loose from his den and rushed, bounding and roaring towards his victim. But as soon as he came near to Androcles, he recognized his friend and pawned upon him and licked his hands like a friendly dog. The emperor surprised at this, summoned Androcles to him, who told him the whole story, whereupon the slave was pardoned, freed, and the lion let loose to his native forest. Then the moral to the story, gratitude is the sign of noble souls. Notice the power of an image like this, the symbolism, if you will. The children can obviously appreciate a story like this, but adults might read this story at a profoundly different level. That idea of making sure that we take care of those in our life and show gratitude. What is it that Wordsworth will say, a 3A observation here, what is it that Wordsworth will say in Tintern Abbey, your man is great in regards to those little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. It's not that Androcles would take the thorn out of the paw of the lion so that later he could call in a, you know, a payback, if you will. It's just the thing that Androcles does. It shows something about his temperament, his character. The next story is another famous one, The Heart and the Hunter. It runs like this. The heart was once drinking from a pool and admiring the noble figure he made there. Ah, said he, where can you see such noble horns as these with such antlers? I wish I had legs more worthy to bear such a noble crown. Is it, it is a pity they're so slim and slight looking. And we think of the Narcissus the, the Narcissa story, right? Uh, um, the, uh, the narcissist story of, of looking into the, into the uh, waters and all of that. You'll remember this with Eve in Milton's Paradise Lost as well. But notice here, man, I have beautiful horns on my head. I wish that I had legs that were stunning and large to, you know, mirror it as well. At that moment, a hunter approached and sent an arrow whistling after him. Away bounded the heart. And soon, by the aid of his nimble legs, those little legs, he was nearly out of sight of the hunter, but not noticing where he was going, he passed under some trees with branches growing low down in which his antlers were caught so that the hunter came in time up and alas, alas, cried the heart. And then we get the moral to the story, quote, we often despise what is most useful to us. It's a compelling insight. It works on so many levels. Again, notice how children can read this at one level. Adults can read it at a completely more profound, sophisticated level. It's quite an insight. How about this one? The man in the wood. A man came into a wood one day with an axe in his hand and begged all the trees to give him a small branch which he wanted for a particular purpose. The trees were good-hearted and gave him one of their branches. What did the man do but fix it into the axe head and soon set to work cutting down tree after tree. Then the trees saw how foolish they had been in giving their enemy the means of destroying themselves. This one doesn't have a moral. It's almost, we might say, self-evident in a way. From the forest, of course, comes the very handle of the ax, which will in turn cut down the forest. This idea is going to be one that's very famous in the history of political thought. One must be careful with one's decisions because they can seem inconsequential and yet can lead to all kinds of political difficulties down the line. We can read history in many ways, we might say, uh, this way. The next one is, uh, I, said, I said before, maybe one of the most famous, uh, the Androcles story, but here's maybe the most famous of all of Aesop's stories, and we'll go ahead and read it, even though it's maybe one you're familiar with, the ant, of course, and the grasshopper. In a field one summer day, 
A grasshopper was hopping about, chirping and singing to its heart's content. An ant passed by, bearing along with great toil an ear of corn he was taking to the nest. Why not come and chat with me, said the grasshopper, instead of toiling and bowling in this field. I'm helping to lay up food for the winter, said the ant, and recommended you do the same. Why bother about the winter, said the grasshopper. We have got plenty of food at present. But the ant went on his way and continued its toil. When the winter came, of course, the grasshopper had no food, found itself dying of hunger, while it saw the ants distributing everyday corn and grain from the stores that were collected in the summer. Then the grasshopper knew, and again the moral of this one, it's best to prepare for the days of necessity. This is, of course, that tension that we often will see between you know, um, planning for the future and or just worrying not at all about the future. Right? And in that regard, we have a wonderful... A, a lesson, we might say. Our, our next one that I'll share with you is is, is a strange one. I want to I want to share. I mean, some of these you've probably heard of. This next one, I'm going to guess you've probably never heard of unless you've studied Aesop's Fables in close detail. This one's called the Young Thief and His Mother. It's a fascinating. One. A young man had been caught in a daring act of theft and had been condemned to be executed for it. He expressed his desire to see his mother and to speak with her before he was led to execution. And, of course, this was granted. When his mother came to him, he said, quote, now this is the son speaking to the mother, I want to whisper to you. And when she brought her ear near him, he nearly bit it off. All the bystanders were horrified and asked him what he could mean by such brutal and inhuman conduct. It is to punish her, he said. When I was young, I began with stealing little things and brought them home to mother. Instead of rebuking and punishing me, she laughed and said, it will not be noticed. It is because of her that I am here today. He is right, woman, said the priest. The Lord hath said, and now the, uh, the, the moral to the story, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart therefrom. End quote. Now, of course, this is a very interesting little fable. And of course it raises one of those kind of fundamental sociological questions that we will enjoy when we study Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein, and the idea of who do you blame for the fact that the monster of Frankenstein's creation does bad things. Notice the suggestion here is that the child has been raised inappropriately and therefore the mother should be held responsible for the actions of the child. Whoa! Now that is an interesting debate discussion. Notice this is not a fable that normally we might share with children, but certainly one that is, as older readers we will look at and say, hmm, that's very interesting. To what degree do you hold a parent responsible for the actions of a child? Or we might say an adolescent in that regards. I see some of you smiling. This is an interesting story, right? An interesting story. It's all about responsibility, isn't it? Well, we've got another famous story uh, that, that I'll share with you called Hercules and the Wagoner, which I, it's, it's a short story, but it's a fascinating one. A wagoner was once driving a heavy load along a very muddy way. At last he came to a part of the road where the wheels sunk halfway into the mire, and the more the horses pulled, the deeper sank the wheels. So the wagoner threw down his whip and knelt down and prayed to Hercules the strong. Oh, Hercules' prayer. Oh, Hercules, help me. In this my hour of distress, he, he quotes. But Hercules appeared to him and said, Tut, man, don't sprawl there. Get up and put your shoulder to the wheel. Maybe a line you've heard before. The, the moral here is, the gods help them that help themselves. This notion of responsibility for one's own actions, it's obviously a, a, a central part of this story. Let me share another one with you that's somewhat enigmatic that you might find fascinating. It's not a very long one, but it is a remarkable one. Um, the Old Man and Death. An old laborer, bent double with age and toil, was gathering sticks in a forest. At last he grew so tired and hopeless that he threw down the bundle of sticks and cried out, I cannot bear this life any longer. I wish death would only come and take me. End quote. But... As soon as he spoke, death, a grisly skeleton appeared and said to him, What wouldst thou, mortal? I heard thee call me. So death shows up. I'm sorry, you, you called. The wagoner, uh, the, the uh, old man. 
Please, sir, replied the woodcutter, would you kindly help me to lift this collection of sticks on my shoulder? That is to say, the moral to this one, we would often be sorry if our wishes were granted. We, of course, at 3A think of the Scrooge story, don't we? Scrooge, so focused on all of his millions and millions of dollars, but the night that the ghosts visit him, the ghost of Christmas past, of course, upset Scrooge somewhat, the ghost of Christmas present, a little more upset, but it's that final ghost, it is in fact death, that will simply point at Scrooge's tombstone, and it's at that moment, as we have said many times in 303, right before one dies, we all speak the same words, the words are, oh my God, the only question is the inflection of the voice. Most of us are not prepared for the moment of our death, and we ask, oh my God, what have I done with my life? This, of course, is a little story that plays very similar games. There is the story of the hare and the tortoise, and even though it's so popular, I love to read it with students, to hear it one more time, and I'm going to challenge you. Think about the powerful symbolism in this story. The hare was once boasting of his speed before the other animals. I've never yet been beaten, said he, when I put forth my full speed. I challenge anyone here to race with me. The tortoise said quietly. It's always, I loved, I've always loved that it's quietly. Because when you look at a tortoise, you think if it had a voice, it would be a quiet voice, a wise voice, we might say. I accept your challenge. That's a good joke, said the hare. I could dance around you all the day and all the way. Keep your boasting till you've beaten me, answered the tortoise. Shall we race? So a course was fixed and a start was made. The hare darted almost out of sight at once, but soon stopped to show his contempt for the tortoise, lay down to have a nap. The tortoise plodded on and plodded on, and when the hare awoke from his nap, he saw the tortoise just near the winning post and could not run up in time to save the race. Then said the tortoise, and this is, of course, the moral of this one, plodding wins the race. It's altogether possible that you've heard this in your life growing up. It's, the race is not always to the swift. 